He has a two-time Elite Series champion, a three-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, the C-O-double-B, Brandon Cobb, this week on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And if you're hearing me, it must be hump day. You're halfway through the week. So happy hump day to you. And it's not just any hump day this time around. You, you guys, for new viewers, you can find us here every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Put a little hump back in your hump day, as we like to call it. Um, but this isn't just any Wednesday. This is... May the 4th, and if you're a Star Wars fan, it's May the 4th be with you. So um, for all the Star Wars geeks out there, and I, I don't mean that in a negative. I mean, being a geek, turns out in real life, it's probably a good thing to be because you'll probably be a little bit more successful. I mean, um, truth be told, I mean, the only time a geek is a bad thing to be is when you're in school. So if they're calling you a geek now, don't worry. You'll probably employ them later. Um... This week's show is going to be a fun one, uh, one I've wanted to do for a while, and um, one of the best compliments that I ever get from any of you guys, and and I thank you, each and every one of you, every comment, every feedback, every like this gets really helps this grow, and this community gets bigger and bigger every week, and I am so thankful for it, but one of the best compliments that we ever get is, man, I learned something new about said angler said person and um i think you're gonna learn some new stuff about this guy um I, I had no idea before this conversation some of the things that i learned um he's a connoisseur uh, we'll get into that as the show goes on but uh speaking of the show going on i guess this is the time when i'm supposed to bring in the guest because that's what you came here for so without further ado let's bring in Two-time Elite Series champion. Won both those in his first season on the Elite Series, mind you. Three-time Classic Qualifier, the C-O-double-B, Brandon Cobb. The C-O-double-B, are we, are we, is this, where is this? Is this your garage we're getting to, into or what? What? what, what no, or? Well, it's a spare bedroom in my house that became my tackle room because nice. we don't have enough. My house is too small. We don't have enough space, so I have stuff crammed everywhere. It looks like a storage closet, doesn't it? Like I'm in the yeah. closet. Well, it's, also, I mean, it's my fishing room slash computer game room. So do you not have enough room or do you have too much tackle? I guess it's the age old question. A little bit of both. <laughs> A little bit of both. I was intending to build, but we didn't we haven't got to that point yet. Well, tell me about speaking of that point, where do you think you're at with your career right now? Like if somebody had to say assess your career and how it's going, I mean I, I'd say well, yes. Sure. No, I think it's going well. I mean, I definitely don't I, – I, like, I still don't feel – like, I've been doing it between FLW and Bass. This is like my ninth or tenth year. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been doing a while, but I don't really feel like a veteran by any means or like – like, I definitely experience. I've been everywhere. I've done it for a while, but, like, I still – I hope to be and still feel like I'm kind of in the climbing portion of my career. I hope like, I mean, I'm still pretty young. I, I'm older than most people think cause I'm 32. Most people think, I, I guess I look a little younger than I am. I full beard and everything I got, but uh, no, nah, I still, I, I still intend to do it for a while. And I think, I think I'm not, I'm still climbing. I hope still figuring things out. I still learn stuff every year. I'm like, God, I was an idiot last year. I still, I still learn things every year. Do you think that ever changes? I mean, do I, you th I doubt it? I feel like you could ask Rick Klein, who probably literally knows everything, and he still learns. I bet I would think he learns every tournament or every year. Yeah, I mean that. I think once you stop learning, that's when you see people recess. And that, maybe it's every sport. Maybe it's every. But because we're so intimately involved in fishing, that we think it's this sport. But it is kind of a lesson in life. Once you think. I know it all. Those people generally start sliding back down the hill. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I think when I was in college, I thought I knew it all, fishing-wise, and then realized I probably didn't. I think I think there's probably a point where you feel like you're learning everything, or like, I don't know what else to learn, but then 
it just a new technique pops up or you go somewhere and see a situation you've never seen or something, ev- everything with it. I mean, even just like career wise doing it for a living, there's a lot to learn. That's not just fishing. So, yeah. And I, and I think it's also constantly changing and not just the electronics right. and all that that you got to stay on top of, but the means of communication, I mean, pros of the past had to fish tournaments and that's it. They focus on bit, 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 you guys. I mean, you have to deal with stuff like this. You're constantly doing social media. Is that, is that a good part of your job or is that just kind of a necessary evil for you? David Mullins called, but um, I, it's not something I, I, I don't dislike like the social media and like podcasts and all any type of videos and stuff, but it's something I'm not that good at per se. I mean, anybody that follows me knows I am active on social media, but I'm not like great at the YouTube and thing and like doing all that. It's not something I like. I think a lot of guys, especially the younger generation, they catch a fish like, oh, social media. <laughs> when I catch one, I don't think that. Like I, I'll throw one back, but man, probably should have a picture of that, you know. But uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things I don't think about as much. But I, I don't dislike it. I just don't think it's something I'm great at either. Why? Why do you think you're not great at it? Like, is it how I, often I, you do it, or it's just not something you're comfortable with? I, I'm not. I don't. I guess I'm comfortable with it. I just don't think about it mm-hmm. necessarily. Like I don't think when I'm fishing, like to to take videos of everything and post it. Like I just enjoy fishing and enjoy like every, like whatever. I, I don't think about to keep everybody updated on everything. Like I probably should. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we cover a lot of those topics today and, and they'll all be updated by the end of this. That's a good point. Good point. Did you really fish your first tournament when you were seven years old? I did. It's in the paper. Yep. I fished, uh, called the Bowers Rogers tournament on Lake Greenwood. I caught one. It was a, a three pounder. It says in the paper exactly how much it weighed, but it was three something. And uh, I remember I caught it on a tiny torpedo and it swam through a hole of chicken wire on the side of somebody's dock. And it turned around and swam back through the same hole. And we caught it. Wow. I got a fight day. It went through the hole and came back on my Zepka. Wow. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that was the first fish I ever caught. That was the first one. I fished my first one by myself when I was twelve. Though. Wow. So, so did, when you fished that first one at seven, like, at what age was it? Like, man, I I'm doing this. I'm gonna do more of this. I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess it was really like that tournament. Like, I always wanted to fish more tournaments. I guess, but I I feel like I really started understanding what. I was doing like I probably started running the front and like driving the boat and deciding what to do with that when I was like eleven or twelve. Wow! Wow! So that, that's why I kind of like really. It was more than just fishing. That like there's a rather than just being out there on the water trying to catch a fish, there was actually like a rhyme or a purpose to it. You know. At the time, did you see that as different? You know what I mean? Like, did you see other young anglers and realize like? Their dad's telling them what to do, and I'm I'm up front here running the whole. Did did it stand out as different, or do you come from a part of the world where all the dads are just like, figure it out? You're going to be the next Davy Height. <laughs> I don't think I really thought about it, and it's not like my dad like like it sounds like he like like I know there's like the baseball dads they're like get out there and hit that ball, son. <laughs> <laughs> like, but my dad didn't even really care. He, it wasn't like he like wanted me to learn. It's just like. I think he realized pretty quickly that I knew how we were going to catch fish a little better than he did. And uh, I didn't really think about it. I was the only one deciding, like, I was the youngest one out there at the time. I just knew we fished a tournament. I'm like, let's go over here, Dad. And that's all I thought. <laughs> so early on, were you like, man, I want to do this for a living? Or did that not even come into the equation? You just wanted to do this that weekend. Well, like, I don't really remember that specifically, but I do know I watched every Bassmasters tournament back then. And I like that article says dreams of being professional angler. So obviously I said I wanted to fish professionally back then. But I think like when I was like a teenager and stuff, I kind of didn't really think about that. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. I was more thinking, oh, what's the next tournament I can fish? Not like I want to do it for a living. And then when I got to college and everything, it's kind of something I just fell into. Like I, I hadn't gave up on the dream, but like, I kind of had just expected to keep fishing, you know, local tournaments and stuff like I did. Then I kind of won the right things and found my way there before I really knew what happened. Finding your way there, 
you know, I, and I guess the front of the boat thing, I mean, it really only becomes I, the person in front of the boat doesn't matter what age you are. You don't think about it until the person that was in the front of the boat says, Hey, get off the front of the boat. I mean, so I guess your dad was just a good dude and, and allowed yeah. you to. And plus I think as a father, you just see certain things and you're like, man, if my kid can run the trolling motor, I want to watch this and I, w- I want to watch him learn. Um, yeah. Was when, when you look back on those you know, you went through college and all that sort of thing, but it, it feels like it was a different time. Like as short a time ago it was, but if you look at collegiate fishing, That's you were part of the era where you were like, let's start this club. And yeah. and now it's like, you listen to those guys talking how dialed and in tune they are with every region. I mean, d- does it feel the same to you? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just progressed so much more. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, like when I was young, I, like I had never even fished a lake outside of the state until I mean, geez, it was probably like my sophomore year, junior year of college. Like, yeah, they just have opportunities now we didn't have. But, like, I mean, I had opportunities growing up. Like, my dad, like, with that, but I was probably, I mean, looking back now, it's a different time, like you said, because nowadays, how many 13 year old kids are going to, our parents can feel safe to put on the lake by themselves and stuff like that? It was just a different time then. Like, it was, uh, I, I just feel like, I mean, I had opportunities to get where I am because of what dad did. I mean, I, we had a 20 foot Triton at the time and he literally would let put me in the water and be like, all right, good luck. He did tell me though, the whole time growing up or when I was real, real young around the boat, he said, I have a gauge on that boat and it tells me if you go faster than 35 miles per hour. And I believed him for like three years. I would run like right at 35, like Peter the line and I go like 37, but oh God, he's going to know. <laughs> I did that the whole time growing up, but yeah, I definitely owe a lot of now where I am to that opportunity. Yeah, and and I think that there's no time in life really when you when I look at different things now, I don't think there's a time in life where you could learn like you could then. Really, no. like to 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 learn it today, like if you didn't learn it then, I mean, you're just not going to allow yourself the distractions to. I mean, you're on the lake, you like you've got no choice but to figure it out. Well, and even media wasn't then like, yeah. it is now. like it's not that long ago. I mean, I'm not that old, but there wasn't, there wasn't thousands of websites telling you how to do this technique, YouTube videos telling you how to do this. I mean, that was the only way to learn then. I got to spend 12 hours on the lake and catch like one. And you don't know how many days what I used to do when I was like 13. I'd go bass fish till about, I don't know, lunch. I wouldn't get a freaking bite. And then I'd be like, God, oh, this sucks. I'd go catch some bluegills and I'd go gar fishing. That's what I do for like two hours to get myself not bored anymore. Because when he used to drop me off at the lake, dad would go to work. And like, it's not like I'd be like, okay, I want to go home. Because he'd be at work. He wouldn't get off till six. So he'd drop me off at six. And I'm like, well, I got to figure out something to do until he gets off at six to come get me. I've caught one bass and he's 11 inches long. So <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> like a gar fishing. <laughs> I mean, gar fishing can be fun. Do you, do you gar fish today or no? I haven't gar fishing all the time, but I was actually, I was like, I don't know if I was delirious or what, but sometime at Chickamauga when I was freezing, I was thinking some gar, I saw some, I was like, what if we just ended up targeting gar? Like, what if we were talking about the gar master elite series right now? And that was the trail. I don't know. I was thinking about that chick talking about gar. I was like, what is the gar master elite series? Like I caught a 46 inch today. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it could have been. I mean, why why do you think it was bass, first of that's all? That's what I always wondered. Like, Cause it, back then, like when it started, I think people take it for granted, but it was literally like people fish for different species, but there was not one that stood out as like bass. That's the one. And it was just chosen. I and outside of just being everywhere, I've never been able to figure out why it became the one, you know, the that one. everybody wants to catch. I know. I think about it. I mean, gar are a way easier to catch. Most yeah. of the time. They're weighty. But would they be if everyone was fishing for them? They're kind of rough to hold up, like for pictures and stuff, but. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. I don't (laughs) want that slime hitting me up on the stage because they stink. (laughs) They they do stink. Uh, And would Garby is easy to catch if everyone was fishing for them? Probably not. You see? That's probably why bass are so hard. Yeah. And we'd be having a conversation right now being like could you imagine if it was the bass master classic They're everywhere <laughs> <laughs> what it was everywhere is 
we talk, I talk to a lot of people on this show that, you know, come from different areas and some of them, you know, are not rich in a blueprint, so to speak. Like, well, there's that pro who lives up the road, but the part of the world you grew up in, you, there's a lot of professional activity around, you know, a lot of activity around professional bass fishing, a lot of different pros, a lot of history. Do you think that helped you get to where you are? Yeah, I think it's just, I think the reason you see that so many pros from around here, it's just our lakes. Like, there's very few places around the country I go that I'm like, not, don't understand at all. Like, there's a lake within a couple hours of me pretty much every time that I grew up fishing that reminds me of somewhere else we go. Like, I think that's why you see so many pros from around here. Because yeah. it's the gra- grass took me a little while because I don't have any grass. But and small mouth, but like just your general like reservoir style lakes, there's something just like it somewhere around here. And even spotted bass act a little small mouthish. So it's uh it's, it's like I think that's why you see so many pros and the foundation around here is so good because it's it's I would say and not mention just ease of access lakes. I think I got like seven tournament class lakes, like lakes that the elite series could potentially come yeah within three two and a half hours of me. So it's just this area is just so easy to easy to learn different techniques. I can go catch spotted bass in forty foot of water one day. I can go fish dirty muddy water one day. I can go fish cypress trees at Santee. It's just so much different stuff around here. Yeah, it, and it, you know it's funny because that's been a big topic around my part of the world. And you know you see what a bunch of Canadian guys have done the last few years on tour. But and I didn't even realize it growing up. But like if you live in southern Ontario. Outside of literally tidal fisheries, you have fished everything. You know, we have grass lakes, we have rock, you know what I mean? Like it, it didn't, and I didn't even realize that honestly until I started traveling with bass and I'm like, wait a second, if you grow up in Oklahoma, you never see grass. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, it, you don't realize how those bountiful areas are such an advantage. And, and I think growing up in them, you don't realize it until you get out and you fish the rest of the world. Was it the same for you? Yeah, it was. I mean, I didn't, and it took a little while too to kind of take what, learn how to take what you know, like rather than going to a lake and trying to do what you're supposed to do or what you hear people do from videos or whatever, you just go to like, like when I went to Fork last year, for instance, I looked at, I was like, this looks just like Clark's Hill or in 2019. I was like, it looks just like Clark's Hill and I grew up fishing there in the Heron Spawn. Like, let's see if that works. And it was very, very similar. It takes a while to know how to take what you know and kind of adapt it to somewhere a little bit different, you know, because it's not, it's not the exact same, but it's, there's a lot of places you can find characteristics and you just got to take that. That's one of the biggest things is taking what you know and put it to a lake and not trying to do what you're supposed to. That's one of the biggest things to get you in trouble is trying to do what you're supposed to somewhere. If it's not something you know how, or, or, you know, it's your strengths. Why is that such a hard thing to avoid? Like you hear that every, like you almost to the tune, like literally if I interview somebody in their second season on the elites or third season there, when you, especially if you see somebody have a spike and start fishing better and you're like, well, what did you do wrong that first year? And it's like, I listened to the doc talk. I started, but that's before you start every single other interview you hear, you hear people say, don't listen to the doc talk and avoid that. Why is it so hard to listen to that but it's 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 so easy to like it usually happens when you're on a lake and you aren't if you don't catch any for like a day of practice yeah. or a day and a half that's when that happens that's when you're like well i ain't caught crap and everybody says you're supposed to do this and that's what you end up doing when you've probably been better off doing whatever you're strong at even if it might not be the best thing you have more success doing what you are comfortable doing. I think it, it usually comes out these terms very rarely. I think people think like a lot of times during an elite tournament, we just put in practice and we know like in we put the boat in, catch fish all practice, tournament comes. Like, I know what to do. Heck no. <laughs> I think I still remember catching a limit hardly most days of practice ever. And so I think those tough practices is what makes you do weird stuff usually. So when you don't catch a limit, is that because you tried not to catch the limit or because you you're leaving areas, you know, without really realizing what's there, or is it just that you're fishing? What changes between pre-fish and the tournament? Is it just you locked down into one area, one style? 
Dude, I wish I knew exactly because me and Spain, who I travel with, is uh, dude, we got to be the freaking worst practicers on the whole elite series. I don't know. Either everybody else lies or we just, I don't know. I don't know what happens, but we don't. I don't remember hardly ever having a good practice, but usually what ends up happening is you catch two or three fish doing something that you like doing or like something you feel comfortable doing. And then tournament comes, you're like, well, I only had three bites doing this or five bites doing this, whatever. I mean, a couple enough to like be like, I could probably catch a couple doing that. And it turns out better than you think when you really put your head down and you're trying a little bit harder in tournament than practice. I mean, a little bit of money on the line always makes you kick it up a notch, but it, I think that's more what it is, is, is you do a lot of different stuff in practice. And then when you focus in on something, then that's when you really start catching them. Because practice, I mean, I might spend two hours fishing deep, then an hour fishing shallow, then fish some docks, then fish some grass, whatever. Do a lot of different things. And you never really know how good any th- one thing is. Until you have the time to, to, to fully pick it apart. That's right. I think that's what it is. All right. Here, here's something I'm... Uh, I mean, speaking of getting comfortable doing different things, is did you really win a coloring contest to to win a fishing trip with Davey Hyde when you were a kid, when you were like 11 years old? Is that I true? Don't, I don't remember how I won it. I thought it was a raffle, but I don't know. Oh, okay. But I, I did put in for it, and then, yes, I won. I went with, I think I was 12. I went with Davey Hyde on Lake Succession. I won a drawing. I don't think he remembered, though. I asked him one day. I don't think he remembered taking me. And, uh, <laughs> you never you're waiting for like the big oh yeah i saw that kid had it you know, <laughs> from his first cast <laughs> don't even remember you <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah but i did i was 12 we went to the late session it was like i'm pretty sure he didn't really want to take me and uh <laughs> it was like january 2nd or something and it was like six degrees and he called me and was like, okay, I, I have an opening. We can go tomorrow. I think he'd be like, you know, it's too cold. But I'm like, hell yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'm in. And we, we, got, we caught one. I caught it. You caught it? I caught it. Well, no wonder he doesn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I caught one. Do you ever think of that experience when you have similar trips and stuff? Because, I mean, let's be honest. Every pro loves to do those things and everything, but they always come like at the end of a it, nothing ever comes timing wise, right? You know what I mean. And uh, but do you ever do you ever think, well, maybe this this kid will fish <laughs> the Bassmaster Elite Series in the future, like I did. I get. I would probably be like him a lot of times. Yes, I do remember some, but like I can't blame him for not remembering me because I could see that happen. We do a lot of trips, and uh, like you said, usually it's like you've been going for two weeks. You get home and you're tired as heck. You're like, all right, I gotta go tomorrow. Let's go one this one extra trip. And that's usually what it ends up being. But no, I do enjoy I do, do enjoy taking like people that don't get to fish a lot and things like that. But I, I don't blame them for not remembering. What do you what do you remember about that day? I mean, I just remember catch, I I do remember it was so cold that I set the hook with that one on a jig and my hand slipped off the reel because my hand was like numb like a ball. And uh I was really in and I looked at Davey, I said, grab him for me. He said, he said, grab him, boat flip him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that. <laughs> I can see him saying, that. "I mean, why, why are you going to grab him? It's so it's cold out. It's cold <laughs> out." What, 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 what were you like in high school? Like as you were grow, growing up, people that don't know you are you about the same, or were you different at all in high school? I don't know. I was really, really quiet in high school, honestly. Up till like my senior year, I guess I kind of got out there a little bit, but I was like. I guess I was the cool kid in the cool group, you know, like the popular kid. But I wasn't, I wasn't uh, like the partier. I wasn't very, wasn't, wasn't real. I was kind of quiet. College, I got more opened up. Like a James Dean esque type character, quiet and cool. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was probably me. I, uh, I was probably, I mean, I fished, the, I, I didn't like partying and stuff in high school and college. I mean, I fished like every weekend. I never went to prom because I had a tournament every time. So. That's a pattern that's developing, like the <laughs> amount of pros that never went to graduations or proms and that sort of thing. Because I get, I mean, it's the spring, right? I mean, there's a lot of tournaments in the spring, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I feel like everything significant school wise is in the spring when every tournament is. So, yeah, I didn't do it. I was like, the I, everybody was always was the, like, knew me as the fishing guy, you know? I think I was in the yearbook as, like, most likely to, like, be famous fishing or something. 
So you lived up to the hype. I mean, I that's good. That. Yeah. Yeah, because I was pretty shit. My high school, I mean, like, I think I started fishing BFLs when I was 16. So that's what, like, 10th grade. So I was, like, pretty serious and efficient by senior year. So there was no other option. I mean, you were gonna you were gonna fish as a pro one way or another. I mean, I like that's so weird because I really don't remember like saying like I'm gonna fish pro. You know, like you hear a lot of guys like that was my dream since I was ten. Like I looked watched every elite tournament. I thought it was awesome, but I don't really remember like dead set on fishing pro. I guess I was like on the path. You know. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think you'd be a better angler if you were a few years younger and went through the college program today? Or, or do you think you've caught up, you know what I mean? Whatever you would have learned. Okay. Let me ask the question two different ways. First of all, do you think you would have been a better angler starting as a pro career? If you came along five years later when yeah. you got to learn all that, but remember everybody else gets it too. I guess that's the thing to keep in mind. The information. Yeah. I think I would have learned quicker. I feel like what I did was these college guys are getting to see all these lakes and learn through the colleges. Dom. Yeah. I feel like I spent my money on the FLW tour and wasted a good bit before I knew a lot of techniques. And I kind of learned it the hard way. I did, yeah. well enough, I did well enough to have like, you know, a little success here and there, but also a lot of them looking back, I'm like, God, I was, did not know enough then. Like, yeah, I think the college guys are just, just ahead as far as, I mean, the biggest thing is they're seeing lakes without coming out of their pocket. A lot. I mean, a lot of colleges, not all colleges, but, a lot of them are getting to travel all over the yeah. country and fish places that we fish. And if they ever do go pro, they're going to go, oh, I've been here three times. And when it's my first time, you know? Yeah. Know before, so I think, yeah, that's the biggest thing. And they're learning from each other, too. Like, it's it's yeah. like you take people from all these different regions. That's the thing that stands out to me. And you're like, okay, this person from up north is a great job shot, a great river angler, whatever. So you're not only learning from a team partner that's good, but you know what I mean? Like if, yeah. if somebody tells you, hey, this is a great bait, you're going to go out and learn with it and whatever. But when you're seeing every little nuance and the way they fish it and the little things that they've figured out about the way they rig it and everything, it just, I just think it makes you that much better. Um, yeah. And even when like, like, you know, I'm like assistant coach at the Lander team. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Well, I'm actually director of fishing operations. <laughs> just is like, that your like, title director of fishing operations yeah it's not all right but, but like i see a lot of those guys like 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 you said some of the team partners one of them might be from here in south carolina and his partner's from pennsylvania or new york yeah. or something so they're they got two different styles to learn from each other and then not just to mention that like there's we send six or eight teams to a lot of tournaments and they all talk so the whole team wants to do good you know do well yeah. and the team from New York might find them drop shot and are doing something different that the team in South Carolina didn't. And they kind of share a little info at the tournament. So they learn a lot quicker than you would on your own. Yeah. That, they learn, not only do they learn a late, they wouldn't have the chance to learn. They also learn from somebody fishing it differently than they probably would have. So as a director of fishing operations, um, after a good tournament, it must be great to come back to the campus, but after a, tough one it must be horrible i would imagine yeah that which i hadn't had that many bad ones since i've had that title so i haven't got too much crap from them yet but uh yeah i don't know i don't know what the because if they do bad i i, I don't really have any punishment for them which i'm not like the coach in in the spring the coach is i'm a little busy obviously yeah so <laughs> the full-time coach is there much so i haven't been around a ton this spring but uh I don't give them much crap if they do bad, so I wouldn't expect much in return, but I don't know. Talk to me about the classic, dude, because you went through something so odd. I mean, this might have been the only podcast that didn't do a pre-classic podcast with you. Yeah. <laughs> this particular one right here. But you were on so many podcasts, you were a favorite. And, you know, everybody, you what is say, that? I sucked, and then I sucked. No, yeah, I'm not saying you sucked. You just... Well, you suck compared to some others, I guess. <laughs> um, but what is that? What is that experience like? I mean, number one, it's cool to go into the event with all that hype. But, but did that affect you? Do you think, or we just didn't hit it at the right time of year? And what did you leave that event feeling like and thinking? No, I, I really, I don't think. Like, I mean, yeah, definitely, I had some like pressure from like 
boat traffic, like followers yeah. and stuff during the tournament. But the the pre tournament, all that stuff, it doesn't. That, that type of stuff's never really bothered me much as far as like changing my game plan and that type of things. Probably made it a little bit harder to focus during the tournament with some of the other stuff going on, like like through after practice, like leading up to the tournament. Versus normally, I just time my rods be done because nobody cared. But <laughs> this one they did, and it made it a lot harder to focus, I guess. But really, that tournament just turned out to be. Like, I actually, uh, my team partner had won a lot of stuff. I'd just been following, like, local online results and stuff before. And my team partner from home had been winning a bunch of stuff. I'm like, God, I bet I know how to catch them, but I don't know how to catch them, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I talked to him after a tournament when I didn't do so well. I'm like, dude, what in the world? Like, what's going on? Like, why did, what, where were the fish I usually fish for? And he said, dude, he said, I knew you were going to have a tough time. Because he said the fish were doing everything that you love to do on Hartwell for three weeks prior to the tournament. Ooh. And then the week before, just it got warm. They suspended everywhere. Everything went all the different. Then it, it, That was different than I've ever seen Hartwell fish in my entire life fishing. It. And uh, like all the, the fish were shallow, a lot were, but majority of the bigger ones were suspended. Like you saw the guys using active target and like that and catching with front looking sonar. And I knew that would be a player, but I grew up fishing Hartwell for 20 something years without active target. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to reinvent the wheel in a week. And I was catching enough fish like under docks, which that's what I did a lot of the time was catching enough shallow and enough to where I thought I'd catch some big ones. And I just did. I mean, I just caught fish, but not as second day was better, but it still is just the fish were weird. I've never seen them act like that over there and i think it was the warming trend this is may a lot suspend normally don't what do you feel like after is they like are you one of the i mean i don't know that i see you as one of the guys that like gets me there's some people that if when they don't catch them you know like you we walk to the other side of the sidewalk because they're just that but you don't seem to be that guy or as i've just not seen it maybe Nah, I usually don't get to. I mean, I like driving home. I might be kind of pissed for a while, but then by the time I get home, I've usually basically forgot about it. Like, I don't, I, I've done bad enough. I've done well. I've done good enough times. I've done bad enough times to where I know I'll do good again at some point. And I don't really, it doesn't help you do good next time if you're mad about the bad one. That's the way I look at it. So you got to get, get over it pretty quick. And but I usually am more mad. Even if I do well in the tournament, if I do really, really good one day and really bad on day two, I'm more mad than if I do bad on day one and really good on day two. I'm at least like, well, I figured it out a bit better. And that's kind of what Hartwell was. That's why if I'd had 17 something on day one and yeah. then 11 pounds or 10 pounds on day two, I would have probably been mad for a couple of days or annoyed that I did poorly. But I just I kind of know what I did wrong on day two and corrected it a little bit. So learn learn for the future you were trending in the right direction so that's right yeah that. if i could yeah. squeak in another day i would have been been better but it uh it, it wasn't wasn't as bad as if the two days had been reversed even though i'd have finished in the same place it wasn't as bad if it had been the other way around what 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 makes the classic so tough as a competitor is it just the rarity like the you, you, there's so few an opportunities to to win it and, and have it line up right like you know what why do you see what you saw with jason christie this year and literally you know that was and he's admitted himself that was just all the pressure that that event had built on his shoulders like that was just the pressure leaving his body on stage um yeah what, the, what makes what it like that good. yeah what the thing that i notice about it which i've noticed like i've had poor classic finishes last three years i mean like middle of the pack i guess like well one was real bad but two were middle of the pack the, the classic just there's so much going on like i'm not saying like pressure on you just like between the takeoff just yeah. cameras everywhere thousands of people i'm like it takes me like three hours every day just to feel like i can focus on fishing like i lose <laughs> I, fish, I lose so many fish and, like this one even at Hartwell, the first day i mean i could have done phenomenal but i lost like half the ones i hooked I just feel like I'm like not focused like the whole that's what that's what I felt like I think it's just a lot of it's just due to so much going on like you a lot of tournaments like you practice all week thinking about fishing thinking yeah. about what you're gonna do and then you got maybe a day off but you're rigging rods thinking about what you're gonna do that one is hard to keep like mentally focused on what you're trying to do and in the tournament there's a lot of distractions 
Thanks, yeah. guys. That's the toughest thing for me. And I mean, there is a lot of pressure. Like, you definitely, like, you know, it's your one chance. Like, you work all year to get the class. You're like, oh, I got to do good because I worked all year to get here. And then you put a lot more pressure on just doing well in it. But then the other side of that, I feel like there's almost less pressure on doing well because all year, if you do poorly, you're not going to make the classic. Yeah. So, so that one, at least, I might say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't have future repercussions other than winning could be really good. But if you do poorly, it's not catastrophic. Like you could be finishing last in a regular season. That's, I think as a, I think I underestimated that with a lot of anglers and I've only just in the last few years really started to feel the pressure that you guys feel in a regular elite series event. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I don't think people from the outside realize how much of a freeing feeling anglers feel at the classic because you know, everybody wants to win it, but once you pass the point where you're like, yeah, I'm most likely not going to win now after day one, you're like, there's, you don't feel pressure. You're, it's all like, I just going to try and make a mark in this event because you're not from a hole, I guess, you know, like, do you feel that pressure all year long at the elites? Like I got to deliver today. Yeah. Well, I used to, so yeah, you always do on day one and two. Like I always feel that pressure. Like I can't do poorly in this one because I might not. My yeah. point was, and used to once I got to day three, I just felt like okay, good. Then the pressure was gone. But it, I guess it was last last year, year before, I made the classic by like three points. So yeah. now the pressure never goes away. Even if I'm in the top ten, and if I'm in like six, I'm like I can't drop the seven because I might make the classic by one point. So now it's kind of never goes away after my experience that one year because I, I made it but i made it by like two points so that's literally two places at some point amongst nine tournaments so yeah. one one 12 inch bass i caught one day probably put me in that classic i think what you pointed out too is also one of the weird things in pro fishing that that is a weird bad habit like you hear a lot of people being like oh i can only i don't can't drop much and i can't you know mm-hmm. i'm just fishing and it's almost like that's the worst way to think about it. You know, it I don't think like that anymore. I did. I mean, 10 I to, years. Yeah. I used to think like, that. I used to think like, let's say I was in like the thirties. I made the cut. I'd be like, well, probably can't make the top 10. So what's it matter today? I'll just go try something crazy and see if I can catch a big bag. Now I'm like, you know what? I made it to thirties. Let's just see if I can move up into the twenties. <laughs> in this one. <laughs> like, like that's, I, I, I used to do like you said, like I used to think that. And then, being close in points a couple of times made me like, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. I'll just try to, and usually very rarely does the like hell with it swing for the fences work. <laughs> very rarely does that. I mean, if, if you caught enough fish to make the top cut, to make the cut, then you more, you're better off probably kind to adapt what you're doing than saying, scrap it, go and do something different. <laughs> that usually has to work for me maybe one time in nine years. <laughs> How often are guys really swinging for the fences? Or do you believe that it, 90% of the time the swinging for the fences is just really a good thing to say on stage when you don't catch? <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of the time, but I mean, I think there's, I think a lot of that when people say that, it means, well, I was intending to fish 20 miles this way because I caught fish there yeah. yesterday, but I caught two six-pounders this way, but that was only two bites I had going that way. And then that's usually what that ends up being, which those two six could have been lost, blind, swimming around and like that. I, I think usually swinging for fences turns out you probably just not on them, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is rotation, is that the modern-day swinging for the fences? Like you hear that a lot on stage now where right. guys will be like, you know, my rotation was off. It had nothing to do with the baits I was throwing in the areas I was fishing. I just got, you know, in that bad rotation when your rotation's off. I mean, you're screwed. You get bad with that. You know what? I, you know what my what I always say is, I'm just so good at finding them. A lot of times, I find where they want to be before they got there. <laughs> I, I do that a lot. I'm like, well, they would have been here in a little bit. They just didn't figure it out yet. They'll get, they'll get there eventually. They yeah. always do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know where they're going. I just they didn't. <laughs> you and Shane room together. Do you guys? Uh, do you guys work together much? You you said you, you are the two worst pre fishers. <laughs> so um, at least you guys are trying to help each other get better and work together, right? 
Yeah, well, we do. We share pretty much anything we find with each other. But uh, to be honest, we kind of just have we have fun talking about practice uh, and everything and how much it really helps each other. <laughs> it's debatable because I'll tell Shane, I'll be like, man, I just caught one off a dock or whatever. And I'll be like, I was in this part of the lake and I'll say something weird about the bank or something. Something I thought was significant. He'd be like, does that dock have a green kayak on it? Like, yeah, I just caught one off that same dock. Dang it. <laughs> we fish like the exact same places. But it, it just, it's happened like, I don't even know how many times. We all, we, me and him fish so much alike that, like, I don't even know why we share info because if Shane finds them, I'm going to find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we do. It, it's done us out a couple of times, especially on grass lakes, like lakes where you know there's a pile of fish in one place. Well, like, we usually, like, one of us will find the grass flat, but, you know, I think we can get checks here and then we'll practice everything else. If we don't find anything, we'll just both go circle around each other, fish the same grass area. It's helped us a few times like that. Do you think that not being part of a team, so to speak, on the Elite Series is a big disadvantage now? Like with the amount of anglers that are working together as a team? Yeah. It, it, I mean, I think certain times, yeah. I mean, it definitely helps. It helps to have – it depends. I don't know. That's hard to say because – if you got too many people bouncing too many ideas, then you just end up on the water. Like I have no idea what to do. So yeah. then you catch them like this, you catch them like this. I like to only have like one person that you trust and you don't know how much truth. If you get too many people, things get kind of skewed around. I, I like having one guy like traveling with Shane has been working for us for like five, six years now. And uh, I trust he's not going to lie to me. And I know he's probably not going to catch me better than I am in practice. So that's another thing that can hurt. If you got somebody you're practicing with that's just like the hero of practice, that's like worse than like not. Like I kind of, it makes me feel better sometimes. When I hadn't caught one in like eight hours, I call Shane just to know that he hadn't caught one too. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> that's good. You know, I'm not that awful. Neither one was had a bite in 16 hours combined of fishing. So they're just not biting. <laughs> That's what we have to tell ourselves. Makes you feel better. That's yeah. right. I get it. I get it. I mean, at least you're not the only one sucking. There's other people sucking. Yeah. Um, it uh, It's just amazing to me. Like at one time there was no teams and now it seems like there's just more and more. And maybe there was more teams. I feel like maybe in some ways you guys are also a lot more comfortable talking about it now. Like I feel like there was a lot of people work together in the past, but we just didn't hear about it a lot. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, like, just looking back, I, like, I guess everybody has a couple people, but I don't know how many guys share to the T, like, no, like me and Shane do. But it, uh, like, waypoints to and everything. But definitely, I'll, I'll, as, as long as you have somebody you trust, it helps. Yeah, I think the trust thing is the biggest thing yeah. because – and it's not even just on where they're sending you to go. It's where they're telling you not to go. And if you don't yeah. trust that person, uh, I mean, you, you know, that's the thing about angling. <laughs> every angler, like every angler that ever watches live on the way home after being eliminated, sees what's going on. It's like, yeah, well, I could have, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it's a thing about fishing. Like you just always think that it would be different if you were in that situation. So I think that, trusting that person is the most important like have yeah. an absolute trust knowing that they're not gonna because there there's a lot of a lot of aggressive professionals there in is. the world of pro fishing is they're not there is you can't trust everybody but I, I i do know one thing me and shane quit doing that we used to do we used to kind of divide the lake up i'd be like i'll fish okay. the upper and fish lower end that sucks that never worked because then one of us would end up I mean, obviously, it's going to be one somewhere in one of our sections of the lake. And if one of us didn't find like, dude, you fished over there. What the heck? You didn't find them? <laughs> like, so we just kind of, now we just fished the whole lake. Fish wherever you want, but we kind of talk about what we find. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, if you, I, I, I want to learn a little bit about you. What, what's your favorite movie of all time? Do you dude, have a favorite movie? I'm glad you asked that. At Santee, you were on the dock. And you asked Koopa what his favorite movie is. And I, you came all the way around the dock to interview me. And you never asked me. And I was pissed. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, here's that <laughs> opportunity to, for you not only to air your grievances, but give us an answer. I thought about that till like 8 o'clock that day. That's why I ain't catching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My very favorite movie. 
You may not have ever heard of it. It's the greatest movie of all time. It's Tremors. Tremors what, about the the, the, the graboids. Yeah. Why is that your favorite movie? I don't know. I've loved it since like I saw it. It's like when I saw it the first time. Like this is the greatest movie ever made. And so I got, I've got them all. Which now DVD is kind of relevant because they're on streaming. Yeah. But I bought the strip, the Tremors Attack Pack. It's got all the movies on DVD. I may have drank a few beers one night and a little bourbon and was uh, on Amazon. And I bought the Attack Pack of Tremors. But I got them all on DVD. And I've probably seen it a couple hundred times. One and two. Three gets a little weird. Four is pretty crappy and five is even worse. Generally. But, yeah, with all <laughs> sequels, really. Yeah, but one and two. By far, my favorite movies of all time. Wow! So you are you drank a few beers? Had some? Are you 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 beer drinker, bourbon drinker? What what do you like to drink? I, mean, I like bourbon, to... but I feel like it's not the best to drink bourbon a ton. I, I drink. I, I'm a bourbon's my favorite drink of all time. I wish I actually bought some non-alcoholic bourbon because I was like, <laughs> I, I didn't love know there was such so a thing. Much. I was like, I love it so much that. If I had some without alcohol, I could drink a little bit at like lunch, you know, and I don't want the alcohol. I just want to taste bourbon because it's delicious. So but you like non- bourbon, do not ever, ever buy non alcoholic bourbon. It's the worst tasting thing I've ever drank. <laughs> <in my time. laughs> so, what's what is a good bourbon? Like, what, what, what would be your favorite kind of bourbon? Do you have my, like specifics? Favorite, favorite, it switches around sometimes, but my current favorite that's not like crazy price like something you can you know buy pretty regularly is yeah. hudson, hudson four grain hudson four grain i've never even heard of that bourbon it, it, is this something you know a lot about uh i mean i know a good bit i've i've had my fair share of, of bourbons but oh see my best friend growing up he uh me and him just kind of got we like like fancy things like food and drinks and stuff. We just want to try everything, you know, like not yeah. that, like we're going to go spend a ton of money on something, but I want to know what everything tastes like. And mm-hmm. so me and him kind of started collecting bourbons and or, well, I say we collect them. I don't really like, I know a lot of guys like you go to their house and they might have a $10,000 wall of bourbon, you know? So I don't have that. I get like a bottle. I drink that bottle. Like, oh, that was good. And then I get another one to try. But he, uh, me and him got like, you know, the Pappy 15 year, Pappy 23, like Van Winkle. We've got all the Blantons, Elijah Craig. We've tried them all over the years. So, Wow. So what is the most expensive bottle of bourbon you've – yeah, or, or shot uh, of bourbon? Like what? what? Well, Pappy 23 is definitely the most expensive I've had, but it's not the best. My, my, my favorite expensive, what I classify in the expensive realm, realm is Van Winkle 12-year. Van w- and how how expensive would a bottle of Van Winkle uh, twelve year it, be? It's actually it's kind of bullcrap because really the bottle's not that expensive. Yeah, but like a, a store, a liquor store might only get one bottle a year, so therefore they charge whatever they want to for it. But Van Winkle usually you end up paying seven hundred dollars ish for a bottle. But that's why we. we <laughs> I am so shocked right now. There's no top part of me that thought we were going to go down a that you're a bourbon connoisseur. When I have a good tournament, or like I don't know, we get back and I go to my buddy's house and we're like, or something good happens. Anytime we want to have like a celebration, mm-hmm. what we do, we get out the bottle of, of Pappy or the 15 year, 12 year. We get one of those, or just Blanton's. Like if Blanton's is kind of expensive, but not as much. But we get a good bottle of bourbon and we order Japanese wagyu steaks. Wow. And, uh, we do that and we cook Japanese Wagyu steaks and drink fancy bourbon and do it a couple times a year. Dude, there's no part of me that thinks anyone's listening to this and they're like, you know, Brandon Cobb with the Zoom hat that has been rolled over a baseball. He loves himself some good Wagyu and a fine bourbon mixture. <laughs> no, we do it. We do it. Uh, well, I don't know how, probably a couple of times a year. Actually, that's why the Japanese Wagyu is like one of the best things I've ever eaten. I just sent, I stayed at Patrick Walter's house down at Santee and I just mm-hmm. sent him some Japanese Wagyu for him to try. So we'll see if he likes it too. You just sent him some Wagyu. What? Well, I stayed at his house for free. So it's about like the same price as renting a house. But. Yeah, I guess. 
Uh, is it the kind of books I never thought you'd be sending people, dude? I got to be honest. I mean, you, there's other layers to you that people don't know. There is. But if you've ever had Japanese Wagyu, oh. I highly recommend you try it. Not American. Me and my friend, American's about half the price. And we were like, oh, we'll try some American Wagyu, you know? It's got to be close. Not worth it. Not Japanese, worth it. You got to get the Japanese Wagyu. Is and that it? Yourself. I buy a roast. You get a whole roast and you cut it yourself. Because it's cheaper than getting an individual steak. I get the rib rib roast and I cut it myself. Because you can cut it into the size steaks you want, and it's like it's like four hundred dollars for like four pounds. So you cut it into like six eight ounce steaks. It's not that awful. Wow, you, <laughs> you are so different than I imagined. I never heard you. I mean, I guess you wouldn't be talking about buying why go by the what what would that be called by the. How do you buy that Wagyu? Like you buy it by... I buy like a rib roast by like four pounds. So then I cut it in a steak. So it's like, it's a ribeye steak. Ribeye. Yeah. Is, it's just, you got to cut it up. Nice. Okay. So it so when you win the classic, w- what is the... I mean, there has to be a bourbon that you're like, man, one yeah, day. I mean, what I, I mean, I'll definitely get a stock. Because when I build a house, we're talking about building. We haven't built yet because it, we haven't got to that point. But I've got land clear and stuff. And that's why I told Amy. I was like, I'm making a bourbon bar. And it's going to be ridiculous. I, you know, I said I'm not the guy that stocks it. Like, has it on the wall. I'm going to be the You're guy. You're going to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be that guy. But I want to get, like, all the pappies, obviously, to have up there. I mean, those are ones, like, in my opinion, there's most of the thousand dollar, seven hundred dollar bourbons. There's very few that are much better than like the seventy to a hundred dollar ones. If you find the right ones, yeah. it's just kind of say like I got it, you know, or like yeah. I've tried it. Like so, I don't know. I'll probably get get some of the fancy ones like that, but I'm more like can't go wrong with a good Woodford or the Hudson or Logic oh. Craig's not my favorite, but some uh some of the cheaper ones, you know. Cooper's Craft, I'd say a really good one. That's only like twenty dollars. Wow, who knew? Who who knew um, that this is so bizarre to me that this is a part of your world? I I, I want to drink bourbon. I I'm not a bourbon drinker, but I think I would like to become one with you when you, you open that right bourbon, bourbon bar. Yeah, have we, the right bourbons. Once you get the right ones, you'll be a bourbon drinker. You're like, man, this is the most delicious taste of it. I was trying. I wanted to make like I wish they made like hard candy. It was bourbon. like bourbon hard candy. That'd be delicious. Really? I like love you, it. So you've, you I mean, I just didn't think anybody ever liked the taste of it. That just grew on them that, you know, I, with, I love it. Like, I don't, I don't put ice in it. Water. Not, well, some of them you have to put water to bring out the flavors. So, certain ones. Why does the water bring out the flavors? Well, certain ones are intended to like make it more, like it needs a slight, like a splash of water to bring them out bring it out like some of the higher proof ones it, you just get that burn if you drink it as straight straight you add a splash of water or a couple of cubes of ice and let them melt then it'll it'll bring out the flavor better wow that's what amy got me for my birthday last year i was a i got like a membership to a bourbon club they send you like a samples every month bourbon of the month club like jelly of the month club the <laughs> gift that keeps on giving yeah i can't i don't have it anymore because i end up just buying bottles of what i wanted to try rather than the samples. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. We need to make a plan that in the future, when you do build said house with this bourbon bar, yeah. we need to do a bod- podcast and, and we'll just sample bourbons the whole way better through. Than my storage room rack in the back then to have as a background. Yeah, wow. I mean, storage room depends what you're into. There's some people who are like, stop talking about bourbon. Tell yeah. me what's in that box back there. <laughs> um, not I'm not one of those people. I'm intrigued by this whole bourbon thing. Um, the other thing that intrigues me about you, if a genie were to land here right now and be like, Hey, you don't have to mess with this fishing stuff anymore. You can be a pro video game player. Would you, would you, would you be gone? Like, would you be like, screw bass masters? I'm going to play video games. Probably would. I really enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy a video game. Uh, no, I, I feel like video games would be a little less stressful living to make than fishing. Yeah, a little, a little cheaper, probably. <laughs> but I like fishing video games about equally. Really, I'm probably, I'm probably better at fishing. I think. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Nothing would make you happier than to come home to a night of video game playing with a nice bourbon and a nice Kobe beef. I mean, when I fall for a week, what do you think I do? <laughs> <laughs> How many hours do you play video games for when you have time? Like, if you, if it, I mean, if I got like nothing to do, which I end up generally like, even when I'm home, I end up having having stuff to do. But if I got like nothing to do, I mean, I could play for like eight hours, ten hours if I didn't have anything to do. Okay, but let's. I usually play. I mean, generally, I'll play like a couple hours for dinner every night. Wow, every no, night. That's some dedication. No, not every night. Five nights a week. Wow, and and you're. It's not just you. I mean, let's expose this whole little inner workings of there's a lot of professional anglers that are, that are that are addicted to video games, just like you. Who, who do you play with? So the crew is kind of split to some different games and stuff, but the whole everybody was it was me and Shane. We were kind of like that Shane. I've always played with Shane. I mean, yeah. since like ever. And then um, David Mullins played, hasn't played lately, and he's not that good. And then John Hunter, uh, he plays. I haven't played with him much. Mike Huff plays. We play with Mike sometime. Alton Jones Jr. is – that's who I play with. Like, we play pretty often. Yeah. And But we all kind of split games up. So, a lot – we used to play Call of Duty. And then Mullins played Call of Duty with us. And Mike plays Call of Duty. And then I switched to a game called Apex that I play mostly now. And it's a little more complicated and a lot harder. And like Mullins was never that good in at Call of Duty, and then <laughs> Apex is a little bit hard. Is actually it's a lot a bit harder, and he didn't have fun playing Apex. So he's so, out now. No more he, Mullins. He's out. I mean, I think he still plays Call of Duty occasionally with with like Mike and Shane. Shane switch. Shane will switch back and forth. Shane will play Apex sometime, and then he plays Call of Duty sometime. Who is the best? Like, who do you think in pro fishing, if they, if they had like a video game off, whatever they're called, um, what are they called? I mean, they actually have video game tournaments. I yeah, yeah no, but is it like just a video game tournament? That was tournament. Cool. Yeah, I played it. I used to play it. Oh, my God. oh you did? So how, how yeah. did you do in them? In Call of Duty. We won a couple in Call of Duty, but they what they do, so a tournament, it's hard to explain, but like the Call of Duty tournaments, they went off your kill-death ratio is what it's called. Like how many oh. kills you get for every time you die. Okay. And they have like different brackets, like beginner, not you know, and it's based off your KD. And then my KD got too high to where I wasn't allowed to play in the amateur tournaments. Oh, so, wow. so we had to quit playing those in Call of Duty. And I haven't played any Apex tournaments because I'm probably not quite as good at Apex, but I've only been playing Apex for like eight months. So I'll get better at it. Yes. Call of Duty been playing since I mean college. So, so I, I so started what do you guys talk about? Like, what? Well, like when you're playing, like with Alton Jr., any of these, like, dude, does this fishing even come up or is it just like, shoot that guy? And a lot uh, of there's not a ton of fish. I mean, I don't know. We talk about fishing occasionally, but it's a bunch of blaming each other for why you're dead. Like, <laughs> you didn't see that guy? He was right behind you. It's a bunch of that. My wife sits outside when if I'm playing at night, and she said, "Just I don't even know what all I say, but she just out, out there like is hysterically laughing at stuff we say apparently." And uh, she said she's gonna record it one night and then have it to play back. But I don't. I, most of it's it's pretty strategic. Like when we get to playing, and especially like Apex has like a rank mode, and it gets pretty serious. You'll get kind of pissed at each other sometimes. Does that ever like? Do you ever like run into like? I mean, I know you said Mullins is no good, but he's the next guest on this podcast. It makes it even more awkward. But uh, um, do you ever like get pissed at somebody and then you see them at the takeoff ramp and you're just like, I don't want to talk to him. He blew up my friggin' whatever. <laughs> it usually passes pretty fast. You'll blame him for a game or two, and then you get back at another one, and then. But the, the term is really fun to play in, though. That's those are pretty good. I used to stream a little bit. I yeah. still have my account. I just hadn't streamed in a while. Like I, some some guys on my Instagram that followed me, I used to share it on there. I, I get 20, 30, 40 viewers watching me play. Wow. I stream, stream playing, but I haven't streamed in a while. Actually, I probably should keep streaming. It's pretty pretty good way to it's like media wise. Good thing yeah. to do. I haven't, streamed in a, I haven't streamed in a bit. Is Ronnie Moore any good, or is that all just well, talk? Ronnie's middle of the road. Like he's not not terrible, but not phenomenal all right so so who intimidates you of the group like if you if you 
I mean, I'm thinking you're going to be part of the mix if you're saying. I mean, there's good. not another fisherman that'll beat me. Whoa. I do. I do know somebody that is. Uh, they probably don't even remember, but um, Matt Robertson. When we used to play Call of Duty a lot, he bet me that his son could beat me in Call of Duty in Warzone. He he uh, he bet. Well, he bet Chris Johnston that he his son. That. Chris called me and said, "Hey, should I take the bet?" Will you one v one his son? And I looked up his son. There's like a stats tracker, so I looked up his name, and uh, it it would be close. Our stats were pretty much the same. So his son. Wow. How old's his kid? Do you know? I don't know. I'm sure he's young. Yeah. It's kind of funny when you play because, like, I guess it's just the the generation I am. Like, to a lot of older people, they're like, "You're 30 playing video games." It sounds weird, but then. Like all my friends I know that are 30, we still, we've all played in high school. We just never quit, you know? Yeah. And then when I play with randoms online, like you'll get one guy that's 45, and then the next guy you talk to is 12. <laughs> kind of a whole genre of people that play now. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty fun, though. Like when you come back from a bad tournament or something, and you're like, I don't even want to think about fishing. Or even just, you know, like, you know, yeah. I need to break from fishing for a couple of days. You don't really think about anything else other than playing it when you're playing it. Get me a fine batch of bourbon yep. and, a, and a video uh, game. Bourbon, though, it really hampers your video game skills. Does it? Bourbon uh, will throw you off. Well, like, guy will shoot you, and then, like, three seconds later, you turn, and you're like, oh, yeah. That's where the 12-year-olds have an advantage, you see. <laughs> Better down through the night. <laughs> <laughs> They're focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is winning and not, not drinking bourbon. Um What's your goal in, in the sport of fishing, dude? Like, do you have an overall goal? Like, is it titles? Is it, what? what is it? I mean, I've always, ever since I started, like, yeah, you want to win, but I've always wanted to be, like, like more the so than winning a tournament, I want to win AOI. Like, be consistent enough to do that. I mean, obviously, the like, classic, but that's, you know, generic. Like, everybody wants, I mean, obviously, anybody yeah. wants to win the classic. But, like, to me, consistency is almost, I take more pride in being consistent than I do in winning. Obviously, got win to make it to make some money, but yeah, because uh, that's what the year I won was honestly one of the most frustrating years I've ever had. Because I won two tournaments and finished like last, and that's not what I do. Like I've made my living being consistent. And last year and this year, I kind of feel like I've got back to what the way I fish is: be consistent, and that's what. I, and I guess so my ultimate goal would be I want to win AOI because that's the, I mean, that's the measure of consistency is winning AOI. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 and you're right. Like when you came from FLW, I mean, that was your track record was like, he's consistent. He's always in the cup. You know what I mean? But then you came here and so how do you fix something in that situation? I would imagine like, okay, now my year was very unstereotypical of me. But I won twice. So, like, yeah. it's hard to fix something which, I mean, on paper it wasn't broken. Or did you, after that season, feel like, man, I, I need to get back to consistency? I, I really don't. I don't think I changed much. The one thing that I do know the year I did that I did win the two, I, I think the one at Fork, it put me in the classic. And that was the first year ever I've said, you know what, points don't matter. Yeah, And then I kind of did the hero or zero thing. That's not really a thing. Like we talked about, yeah. <laughs> and it, uh, I don't know. Like I just, I felt like I made some weird decisions. And then, I mean, some years you're just not like some tournaments just aren't going to set up for you. And like, I've kind of learned more or like there's certain tournaments where I go into it, like after practice, I'm like, you know, this is probably not mine to win. Like it's not setting up for me. And I've gotten better. And that's why I used, like, when I was at FLW, I knew those were ones. Like, I'm not going to win this one. I just need to go do this, get a check, go to the next one. And I think when I won that, if I found fish, it's like, man, I can't win doing that. I just got to get a check. You know, I, I'll go do something else. Or I just got, like, it's just going to maybe get a check or not. I'll go do something else. And when a lot of times, like you said, you found more you think you have. So if you yeah. think it's barely check fish, they are, they might be like top 10 fish. So I, I think that's kind of what, what consistency comes from. 
I just realized this podcast uh, airs on uh, May the 4th uh, and May the 4th be with you type thing. Are you a Star Wars guy or no? I never got into Star Wars. I mean, I've watched them all. Yeah, I've watched them all. I like like sci-fi. Sci-fi movies are all like like Tremors. They're all like my favorite. I like all this. But I'm more of a Marvel, like superhero. I love every, there's not a Marvel movie I have not seen. I love every superhero. I didn't like comic books, so that's what's weird. You think like growing up, I'd been a comic book guy. Never, never did comic books, but any like any superhero movie show, I've seen them all. All of them. Who, who's your favorite superhero? If you could be one, which which would it be? I mean, my favorite movie ones to watch movie uh, like Deadpool is hilarious, but you obviously don't want to be Deadpool because he's all messed up and stuff. <laughs> but uh, if I could be one, I think Wolverine's probably one of the coolest from X Men. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, who who on the Elite series? Who's the closest to being a superhero? If you did like if who's Nobody, dude. I don't even. I can't even think. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that could even be a thing. Yeah. Are you intimidated by Greg Hackney? A lot of guys are intimidated by him. I wouldn't say I'm intimidated by him. I don't really know how to take him. Sometimes, like I talk to him, I'm like, is he pissed at me? <laughs> like, is that like I? I don't know. Like I wouldn't say intimidated, but I'm kind of like, I'll stay over here and you're there. Yeah. I like Hackney, but yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, I guess he is a little timid. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that I, I think he is one of the most amazing faces. Me and Overstreet talk about it all the time. Like if you watch his face, and I did it when I had him on the podcast. Like if you go back and watch the episode I did with Hackney, literally just watch it and pause it whenever you want. Just randomly pause, and every single like most people when it pauses, they're like. Hackney's face means something every single time you pose it. He's got like this, like he's got like a rubber face that is very shows emotion in so many ways, you know, without having to do a lot. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, I could see how he'd be intimidating. He can, yeah. Well, like, I guess I am a little intimidated by him because, yeah, like I think at Chick on day two, I ran in a pocket. And normally, you know, if somebody's in a pocket, I might fish the other side and they're on the other side. And they're like, I think that's hacking. I think I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm not going to fish this one. <laughs> so <laughs> so maybe a little. Or intimidation. A little respect, probably. Yeah, respect's a better word to use. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you think gets the most respect in the Elite Series? Got to be Clun, right? Yeah, I mean, 100%. Like, yeah. I, if you don't respect Rick Clun, I don't respect you. That is the freaking. <laughs> comment of the decade, dude, and it is the truth. If you don't respect yeah. Rick Klon, I don't respect you. Do you think Rick Klon, if he chose to, I don't think that that has been one of his cho- chosen activities, but if you think if he got into video games, do you think Rick Klon would be good at it? Uh, probably. If he put his mind to it and wanted to be good at it, yes. I think he could probably, probably get pretty good. Yeah, I imagine so. He drives I'm- his boat, like, you know, he's been doing a while, and, like, I kind of figured, like, I mean, I kind of take it pretty easy in mine. And he passed me at St. John's one year, and I was like, this is kind of hurt my back, you know? I'm like, <laughs> mouth to mouth, like, I'm a little out of control feeling. Rick Clun came by at 80 miles per hour, it felt like. I'm like, man, I got smoked by Rick Clun. I, it's amazing what he does. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think anybody gives him near enough credit, like, to think of – think of how tired you are after an event and – it, and he's it's it's incredible. Like I, I'm amazed that there's not more mainstream media talking about Rick Clun. To be it's honest, incredible. I don't know exactly his age, but it is impressive that he's 75, been doing five. I believe seventy five. Yeah, that is crazy. I don't know if I'll like. I'll probably be sitting in my chair when I'm seventy five. I don't know. I don't think I can still be fishing. Surrounded right. by rich, rich collection um, of bourbons. But, yep. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. That's, that's, that's impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Very impressive. And, uh, and so are you. And, and I think that there's no better line to end this on than what you just said. If you don't like Rick Lund, I don't like you. And if you don't like Brandon Cobb, I don't like you because uh, you're a good dude. And, um, Appreciate I look forward to, um, inviting in, uh, what, what would a good adjective be for a bourbon in a, Musky Bergen, <laughs> bourbon or a, 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 what's a good analogy for? A, I um, look forward to getting drunk with you. I don't. 
that, that music is my call, right? With that, yeah, a good analogy for a bourbon. Yeah. I mean, I don't the the bourbons I like are with a hint of vanilla. Ah, yes. Favorite ones. Yeah. Well, I hope we're inviting in a rich bourbon with a hint of vanilla. <laughs> and uh, thank you for doing this. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for having me on. I had a good time. For some strange reason, I have a hankering for a rich, rewarding bourbon right now. Who knew? Really, like, like who knew that he was a bourbon connoisseur? Wants candies made of bourbon. Um, wow. Wow. That's the coolest thing about this show. You're always learning and not just you when i say you i mean all of us as a community and i'm part of that community um we're all all learning and um i thank brandon cobb for a great interview um very open very honest and uh, very real he always is and that's what this show tries to be so from one of my favorite cobs to my favorite cob take it away uncle bob thanks for watching Please like, comment, and subscribe, because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to, you hear?